What does Martin Heidegger have to tell us about the future of religion? And is his work and what he represents in terms of psychology and an understanding of being, is that the kind of thing that is compatible with what Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, said about being? And I think it turns out that yes, it is. It's adding additional detail to certain places that is going to be very useful for us and points us in a direction of a path forward with respect not only to religion, but also to science and understanding intelligence and understanding what's going on in AI. And so I think this might be a little bit surprising, but trying to suggest that you have a medieval theologian who has a conception of being and an understanding of being that actually has space for something as contemporary, as modern, as Heidegger's notion of being may be a little bit surprising. So let's dig into this a little further. Now, this trades upon one key concept in Meister Eckhart's work, and that is the idea of images, build, built in. And so an image for Eckhart is any obstacle that gets in the way of God. It is anything that comprises a hindrance. It is any kind of idea. It is any kind of concept. And now it's important that it is an image and that it is an idea because that recalls not only Christian history, but also with the image of dynamic imago, imago dei, imago Christi, but also an idea in, in the form of eidos, a form, a platonic form. And so for Eckhart, an image is anything that gets in the way. And so any kind of image that we are colored with in terms of ideas about the external world, ideas about the things around us, the people around us, about what it is that we're experiencing, anything in the realm of multiplicity, anything that is distinct. In other words, if it's possible to say that it's not this or that it is this, then it's an image. And so because that is a very general understanding of things. And the clearing away of these images, literally for Eckhart, the unlearning of them, the unknowing of the images and this mystical shedding of them, because it's that kind of conception, and this gets us back to a kind of ground of being, and uh, literally for, for Eckhart, a grunt, the ground, the ground of God, the Godhead, and uh, that being a oneness of being, of divine being. That enables us to have space for something like Heidegger. And so I've asked this question, for instance, with Kierkegaard and saying that, you know, Kierkegaard has an important insight for us with respect to authenticity, with respect to the emphasis on the subject and the subjective experience that is in addition to and maybe even subsumes as a part of uh, uh, subsumes physical experience as a part of it. In other words, physics, mechanistic physics. Newtonian physics and mechanics and the you know conception of the world as a giant clock and now as a giant computer or whatever it might happen to be. Any kind of world of efficient causes like that where you just have billiard balls bouncing into each other. Oftentimes people look at this and say, well, that doesn't include the human experience. That leaves this out. It either means that the human experience is epiphenomenal, that it's just an accident that's totally unimportant, it's an illusion maybe even, or that we're missing something. And ever since Rousseau, which is a really long time ago now, Ever since Rousseau, about 250 years ago, people have started to wake up to the idea that something is wrong in the mechanistic world picture. And Kierkegaard was part of that. Now, Heidegger was a later part of that. So Kierkegaard helped us in some ways, I think, that I described as, as being useful. And so I did a talk on that, and I would encourage you to check that out. But Heidegger continues this, and he has some important things to say about, especially the psychology of habit and the way in which we have values and expectations, preconceived notions, and habits. And habits, I would say, and I have said in an article in 2010, habits of thought and emotion. So these are thought and feeling. In other words, I have habits, not only physical habits, but I also have habits of chain of thought, you know, tending to happen one after another. And so I tend to have thoughts in certain sequences. And oh, by the way, I also tend to have feelings in certain sequences. And it's very regular and very mechanistic in a certain way. In other words, it is very habitual and it is very, by that, non voluntary. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. And Heidegger pointed out that there's a lot of this going on, that there's a lot of this that we 
don't understand and that we don't look at because that is the backdrop against which we even have the possibility of having experience. He called this in some measure background conditions. And so the background conditions are those things that we are given in society in terms of our expectations and values and the way that we see the world that enables experience to be built on top of that. And that's the kind of stuff that just generally we're not aware of. We don't end up talking about it a lot. We're not aware of it necessarily. And it's trouble for us to try and become aware of it because it's just part of how it is that we think without us necessarily knowing what's going on. And so we might tell ourselves stories about, you know, how we think and why it is that we think the way that we do, why we want what we want and why we believe what we believe. But those are things that we construct after the fact. It has really very little bearing on reality and it doesn't change the belief or the feeling or anything else if you change your story. So that narrative is something where we're trying to make sense of ourselves, but it's a contingent after effect, posterior to the real thing. Now, enter some of what it is that we're seeing with intelligence nowadays, where you have equally a black box and people don't know what to do with it. And they're like, okay, maybe we can distill some rules from it. And maybe we can craft a story of rules that tells us what's going on inside. It's the same thing. We're still trying to confabulate and we're still trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And you may have a decent model of it. You may be able to model most of your behavior and beliefs and everything seems to fit into, into a you know world system. And that world system then, that coherent world system where all the beliefs kind of match each other and make sense, that must be why it is that I believe them because they all make sense and they all fit together. That's only what it seems like in retrospect. In fact, the acquisition of a belief has no bearing on this. It has no tie to this. It has no resemblance to this at all. And so that's where Heidegger is most useful, is in pointing out a lot of that kind of stuff for us and saying that, you know, this is everywhere, everywhere in terms of what it is that we believe, what it is that we desire. We didn't do those things necessarily. That's not the kind of stuff that most people consciously try to control. You may not even think that you can control it. Can you control the fact that you like a certain kind of music or that you desire certain things? Maybe, probably not. Maybe you could train yourself to change that and change that, well, it's habit, right? So in some ways, at least insofar as it is amenable to a retraining in the form of habit, then it is possible for us to attain new habits that seem like magic and they seem completely impossible because if I learn to play a piano piece and I have a well-worn habit 10 years from now, that is impossible for me to play today because I don't have the habits. <laughs> And so it's a very powerful force. It's something that allows us to change in ways that it's hard for us to identify with and hard to understand because our vision is so narrow and so short sighted with respect to what changes are actually possible within uh, our, our individual lives. So that's where Heidegger is most useful in that way. And it took some doing, but I think it makes sense even in a frame with someone like Meister Eckhart, and then certainly with Kierkegaard, of course, as one of his existentialist predecessors only a century before. But I'm trying to craft a picture of what it is that works for people now. What kind of religion works for people now? What can the future of any kind of spirituality be? And I think Meister Eckhart has a role to play in that because he doesn't emphasize the things that people tend to have a problem with in Christianity. I think Kierkegaard has a role to play in that because he emphasizes the importance of subjective, importance of subjective experience and a dedicated, passionate commitment to something, even if it's only temporary, even if it's not exactly the kind of thing that Kierkegaard had in mind. Nevertheless, the sentiment at least pushes us in, I think, a useful direction. And the same thing might be said of Heidegger insofar as his insights with being, even though reading something like being in time is a slog, it is a struggle. It's not an easy thing. But as we are working through that, it pays dividends and it pays dividends in terms of us understanding ourselves and understanding the role of habit and how it is that we come to think and feel and believe and then do do understood not only in terms of physical action, but also in habits of thought, feeling, emotion, muscle control, everything. And so I think that's where Heidegger is useful for us. And it's additionally useful to see that Eckhart still had space for this. So we're not constructing something that's, you know, contradictory. Anyway, I hope this is useful. Heidegger is a little bit more difficult and he's certainly not as easy to understand as the bit of Kierkegaard that I wanted to draw from, but he's worth your time. And I think it is, uh, it is interesting and hopefully good to think with. <laughs> so I hope you found this enjoyable.